Welcome to the STARS webinar. My name is David Dorn. I'm Director of Programs and Communication at STARS. We are fully booked out today with uh, 100 participants joining in from across the globe. So wherever you are, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all of you. Today we talk with Lim Seong Guam about the lessons learned from his personal leadership experience and how he sees the role of leaders changing in the future. From Singapore's early years of government to its emergence as a prosperous metropolis, Seong Guam has contributed greatly to Singapore's success as an indefatigable leader and public servant. Seong Guam was group president of Singapore's Sovereign Wealth Fund, GIC, from 2007 to 2016, after which he was advisor to GIC's group executive committee until 2019. Seong Guan has been a professor in the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy at the National University of Singapore since 2005, instructing on leadership and change management. In his long and distinguished career, he served as head of the Singapore Civil Service, as permanent secretary of the Ministry of Defense, the Prime Minister's Office, the Ministry of Education, and the Ministry of Finance. Seong Guan has chaired the Singapore Economic Development Board, the Inland Revenue Authority of Singapore, the Accounting and Corporate Regulatory Authority, and the Central Provident Fund Board. He was also a member of many companies, including Temasek, the other sovereign wealth fund manager of Singapore. Seong Guan is also a member of the STARS International Board. Good afternoon to you, Seong Guan, and thank you for speaking in this webinar. Uh, hi, David. Good to be able to join you. We now have 30 minutes to discuss with Seong Guan. I will take the privilege to ask the first couple of questions to open the discussion. In the meantime, if you have any questions for Seong Guan, please use the Q&A feature below to type in your question. So let's get right into it. Seong Guan, you have served in key positions of the Singapore Civil Service and you have helmed many distinguished organizations. Across your whole career, what have been the three most important lessons learned from your personal leadership experience? Oh, I would say that if I can summarize them, the, the, the three lessons would be think people, think future, think excellence. So the first part a bit about, um, I, I think everything but uh, all of leadership uh, is uh, making good things happen that on their own would not happen. Now leaders are there to make things happen and not just anything, but make good things happen. Uh, so there are these three legs, think people, think future, think excellence. The think people part of it really is how do we enhance the engagement of people. We want people to come to work who are excited about their job and who, are, uh, who want to contribute uh, the most that they can to their job uh, with a lot of energy and imagination and initiative. So think about people uh, that we are dealing with. Uh, next is about think future. Uh, I think thinking about the future is a very unique responsibility uh, let's say of the of the CEO, um, nobody else has that has that responsibility. The CEO has that. Everything else about day to day operations, most of the time, we have people who are in charge of those operations, so they know they have to look at things and make and make the things work day to day. But thinking about the future is that very special responsibility of the CEO. And the third thing is what I call think excellence. Uh, excellence to me is about being the best you can be. So thinking excellence means um, you have to figure out uh, what would uh, make your people do the best that they can. And that's a morale and motivation issue. Uh, what would make your people the best they can be? That's a capacity and capability issue. And finally, how do you bring together the efforts of the variety of people and departments under you so that you synergize their efforts? So think excellence means you're not only getting the most out of each individual and make your people the best they can be. You're also making the organization or the business function in the best way they possibly can. So think people, think future, think excellence. So in order to make good things happen, which on their own would not happen, what do you consider to be the most important qualities of a good leader? When I first entered in the leadership position, I think uh, it's almost an accidental discovery to me. You know, I. I was given the job of, of being in charge of a group of people and some of the people are almost double my age. And the question is, how do you deal with these people who have been a lot more years, a lot more experience, a lot more knowledge? Uh, so how do, how, 
how do I motivate them? And how do I get them to produce good stuff? Um, and I discovered the answer was to, was to find out from them in what way I can be helpful for them. How can I be useful or beneficial to them? Uh, so I discovered that there are certain things that I can do to ease the, to go through the bureaucracy and, and get, uh, get stuff for them so that they can get on with their job. Uh, so over the years, this has really, really built up for me that the most important thing uh, uh, to, to, to make things happen uh, is um, thinking about the people, uh, thinking about how you can help the people um, um, do the best they can. Uh, in other words, put yourself in the other person's shoes. That, that to me is the most important thing. Think of them. Um, and, and, and you know, it's quite remarkable. Just, just recently only, uh, I happened to come across this uh, commencement speech by Jack Ma. Jack Ma, as you know, was the executive chairman of, um, uh, of uh, uh, till recently, of Alibaba. Uh, and it was a commencement speech he gave to NU, NYU, New York University in, in Shanghai. Uh, and this is what he said uh, to the young people for them to succeed in life. Uh, he said, uh, future success depends on having IQ, EQ, and LQ. You know, Jack Ma has this enormous capacity to, to make complex things simple. So he says, success depends on having IQ, EQ, and LQ. He said, people with high IQ do not fail easily. What he means is, you need IQ to solve problems and produce results. And he said, people with high EQ can find more opportunities. What he means is relationship, networking, yield connections, and possibilities. Then he said, but only people with high LQ can win the respect of others. LQ stands for loving people. They say, you think of other people. They say, only people with high LQ can win the respect of others. And if you win the respect of others, this is how we become trustworthy and people can trust you to do the job and, they, and, and, and they'll be loyal and they'll be committed to you. And this business of winning the respect of others and being trustworthy, it applies to customers. So your customers keep coming back to you. Uh, it applies to business partners because we know that we can't run our businesses properly if there's no trust between the partners. Uh, it applies to workers. Uh, it's a relationship between managers and their, uh, and their workers, a relationship between, uh, between leaders and their, and their people. So fundamentally, it is about think of people. Uh, and just a fast closing remark, as you know, I'm, I'm teaching in the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy and the course I teach is uh, what we call effective implementation. Uh, and it's quite remarkable that uh, the most important thing, uh, and, and I see this because of the final papers that the students have to, uh, have to submit to me. The most important thing the students learn in the class is think of the people you're dealing with. Um, it's interesting because all of them came with the idea that leadership is about having the vision and telling people what to do. And what they discover in the class is thinking of people, put yourself in their, in their shoes, and then you will understand what is it that's necessary to make sense of the work and to, and to make people want to do their work with great energy and excitement each day. If you look back on your career and then to uh, current leadership trends today and into the future, what kind of changes do you see for the role of leaders? Well, you know, uh, in a sense, nothing um, uh, dramatic, you, you, you can say in terms of uh, what, what I believe the situation, uh, the greatest challenge for leaders. But let me summarize it this way. I think a lot of us, uh, the way we lead our lives, the way we lead our business, uh, we are dealing most of the time with what I call the known knowns. Um, uh, we know what we need to do and we know uh, uh, to, to get the job done. Uh, and there's a direct cause and effect relationship. You press this button, that's what's going to happen. And life becomes one of saying, each time you see a situation, uh, you decide uh, which pigeonhole to go to, uh, to pick out the operating procedures to get that done. This is the known world. Everything is kind of um, uh, almost predetermined. Uh, you know what's going to happen. The customer comes to you, you ask what he wants, and you know which pigeonhole to go to get the right process. But people discover their life is not as predictable as that. And therefore, when you run a business, particularly as a CEO, you have to think in terms of how things may be different and how do you prepare your organization for that difference. And in that instance, you deal with what is called the known unknowns. 
in the situation of unknown unknowns, you know the critical uncertainties for the future. You don't know exactly what's going to happen, but, um, but um, maybe as you analyze the past and you try to understand uh, the things that happen around you, whether it's geopolitics or geoeconomics or your own local politics, um, you can figure out two, three or four different scenarios of how things may be different. And so with these scenarios in your hand, and this is the known unknowns is the realm of scenario planning. With this, with this ready, uh, 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 various scenarios in hand, and uh, then you can figure out ahead of time, begin to plan mentally, how would you deal with each of these scenarios? But increasingly for leaders, as they think about the future, you see, previously thinking about the future uh, can stop at scenario planning, and you know how to react and you know how to deal with different situations, that's good enough. But I think basically we are now dealing with a situation, there's so much uncertainty, there's so much unpredictability. How can you ever know how to plan for the future of the company when you do not know what it's going to be like? Previously, you can postulate through scenarios and you can figure out your strategic plan, but now you can't even figure that out. And I came across this statement by this uh, professor Roosevelt Cantor of Harvard Business School, where she was talking about financial statements. And she said, you need to understand that financial statements are a statement of the past. They tell you what has happened. Then she said, culture predicts the future. Culture creates the future. Now this is, this, this to me is the most important thing leaders have to think and to seriously take in future is the issue of culture. Culture is that collection of um, beliefs and behaviors and values which you believe uh, are the most important factors for assuring success in future. And now, therefore, you are no longer dealing with trying to respond to a scenario because you can't figure out a scenario. When you deal here with the unknown unknowns, you are dealing with the black swan. Now, of course, there are CEOs who don't care about the black swans, right? But for those who really care about the long-term survivability and success of the companies, they worry about the black swan. And to deal with the black swan, you deal with values. So for example, if you decide that certain values you need is agility to be able to switch tracks quickly, uh, you need innovativeness in your company or creativity in your company. Uh, you, uh, uh, you need um, your business to be relational uh, rather than transactional. Each time, you identify each of these values. Then you look at what is happening in a company today and you know what are the critical things you have to begin to change. And some of these things may, may need a generation to change, but because it takes such a long time to build culture and to switch tracks and culture, because it takes such a long time, that's why you have to start doing it, working on it from yesterday. That being said, uh, what do you see as the biggest, single biggest leadership challenge today? Ah, I, I, I think people are discovering, let's say for COVID-19, mm -hmm. that suddenly you discover that uh, we don't know what the heck is going on. How do I deal with this? Uh, of course, uh, for, for the countries uh, like many, many of us in Asia uh, that had had to experience with SARS, when COVID-19 first came, you say, I take a look at it, it's a coronavirus, people come with fever, uh, and therefore I just treat him the way I treated SARS. And then you begin to discover that, that the virus for COVID-19 does not operate the same way as SARS. And then you begin to wonder, what is it that you have to do? In some instances, you just keep working the way of SARS for much longer than you ought to, rather than your mind being open to, 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 to figure out um, uh, what, what different things you need to do. Now, to me, COVID-19, the, the, the big lesson down there is to say, when you deal with a situation like that, it's new, it's novel, you of course begin to treat it the same way as you experienced in the past. But if your mind is not open enough to say, this is not the same thing and it's not behaving the same way, you're not going to have that agility and you're not going to have that, that, that fast responsiveness to deal with a new situation. So to do that, you need one team of people to be dealing with the day-to-day -day thing. You know, this thing, of what do you do with the patients? How do, you, how do you test the temperature and so forth? But you need another group of people who are saying, now, where is this going? How could things be different? Um, 
uh, you know, do you need ventilators or do you need face masks? Uh, do we have supplies of that? Uh, do, do we have a problem with the food, uh, with the food um, uh, supply chain? What do we do with employment? You need a group of people who are thinking on a different track, almost thinking about the future. So to me, I think that's a big challenge because, um, you know, leaders, of course, all of us, we are very comfortable when things are the same and everything is predictable and as manager, everything is under control. But, he, but I do think as CEOs working in the future, there's so many uncertainties about the future. This is the biggest challenge. You know, how do you, uh, how do you build this capacity to deal with an evolving situation, unfamiliar, uh, and yet the people have to be, have, uh, uh, you, you need to have people who, who think differently than from the past. It's not easy to build up such a group of people. And you, the leader in charge, and your mind is not open, you make things extremely difficult for the people who have to work on these issues. We have a follow-up question on this from uh, Doris Albisser. She is the yeah. chairman of uh, Ivan Globe. She's asking which leadership skills will be more in demand in the future uh, post COVID-19? I think, uh, as I mentioned, I think the most important leadership skill, you, um, um, you know, leaders of course have to be aware of a lot of things, um, but perhaps, uh, um, uh, I mentioned already, we have to look out and think about your people and so forth. But, but let me explain it um, using another idea. You know, there's this, um, if I can write it in an equation, I say um, effective results is a matter of good ideas multiplied by good implementation. You need to get good ideas. Now, how are you going to get those good ideas? And of course, you have good execution. When you talk good execution, that's where I say you think about the people you're dealing with uh, and, and how do you look at the operations, how do you synergize their work and so forth. So in a sense, I've already um, dealt with that when, when I answered the first question. But let me address this question of good ideas. How do you get good ideas? Now, this is an interesting point. Um, I remember a book which I written in 1988 by a chap called Andrew Groves, who was the CEO of Intel. Intel is a chip maker. Uh, a high-tech industry, things are moving extremely fast. And he came up with this idea of what he called inflection power is equal to knowledge power times position power. What he means by inflection power, for those of us who, who, you know, who can remember our high school trigonometry, right? Uh, you say uh, we are familiar with curves that go to a maximum point and curves that come to a minimum point. But you say there are curves where when, as the curve goes to into a maximum point, instead of coming down, it goes up. So you're trying to move your organization to a new growth path, to a new success path. So to, to get your organization on a new success path, you need to have the power to push it through what we call the point of inflection. Now, if I take the Andrew Grove idea, he says, inflection power is equal to knowledge power times position power. If you're in a high tech industry or you are in a situation where things are developing extremely fast. Who has knowledge power? And the interesting answer, for example, in, in an industry like, like um, Intel is, is the new graduate from Stanford or University of Texas, Austin. He's the guy who has the knowledge power, but he's just joined Intel because he just graduated. So what is his position power? His position power is close to zero. And therefore, inflection power, despite the fact that he has all this knowledge, but his capacity to make change in the organization is actually very low. The more interesting question is this, who has position power? I say the CEO, the leader, the senior management, their position power. What is their knowledge power? Now, if the world is unchanging, then of course, the more years of experience you have, the better it is and your knowledge power grows. But if you are now dealing with a fast changing situation, actually the people with the position power, the CEO who got his position because he has been 20 years, maybe 30 years even in a company, actually his knowledge power is low. And therefore you have a situation where in a fast changing or new environment, actually the inflection power of the leader is in fact low. His capacity to switch tracks for the future is actually low because his knowledge power is relatively low 
even though his position power is high, where he can exercise authority uh, and power. So that's my point I want to make. That it's not just an implementation issue. You worry about people and processes there. You have to, you have to think very hard about how do you get new ideas. And new ideas, you must go to who has the ideas and don't ever assume that because you're the leader, you have all the ideas. If you're in a fast tech uh, or change environment, or if you're expanding geographically to some new geography of the world, you actually don't have the knowledge power. And in that instance, better look out for the people and connect with the people with the knowledge. And that's the way by which you're going to build success and greatness for your business. Here's another question from Stars Alumnus Sam Wong. He's the general manager of Schindler in Myanmar. Um, he's mm. asking, what was your greatest leadership failure which you learned most of? <laughs> Okay. Um, you know, when I was in the civil service, I was in charge of a big change movement in the civil service. Uh, and in order to help me uh, manage that, that change movement, uh, I set up a committee of the senior civil servants, a uh, committee just of four senior civil servants, and they're in charge of different aspects of this change movement. And uh, in order not to overload these people who already have, have, uh, have many issues, uh, uh, their, their full-time jobs, um, I decided to have them uh, have to, have to um, lead these committees uh, for only one year, and then every year I change them. Now, there came a year in which kind of the next lot of, uh, of uh, leaders that I have to appoint to these committees, uh, that one of them has uh, certainly expressed extremely negative views about the change uh, movement. And the uh, uh, dilemma that I have uh, as the head of civil service was, do I appoint him or not? If I appoint him, I know that he has negative views, but there can be a hope uh, that uh, once he gets into that position, uh, that he'll that he'll turn turn positive as he thinks much more deeply about how to uh, conduct himself. But on the other hand, of course, um, uh, being so negative, he may uh, he may really upset a lot of people and undermine the whole change movement. I decided to take a risk and to appoint him. After six months, it was plain that he was being negative, and a lot of people were telling me that he's just not not um, uh, not doing a uh, giving proper leadership. And so the dilemma for me at that point is, do I remove him or do I say, well, you know, this is a one year appointment, only six more months, tolerate him and then uh, it's okay. Um, I decided uh, to let him go for six more months because otherwise I felt that I would be really undermining his uh, credibility and his future if I were to remove him midway through because I've never done that before with anyone uh, in, in that position. Well, okay, so after 12 months, I moved him. But by that time, I discovered, wow, there's so much damage that has happened. What is the big failure? The big failure was this, that I was looking at this guy and sort of say, for his sake, um, let me not remove him because it will undermine his credibility and undermine uh, how, how people uh, look at him and perhaps even undermine his promotional um, uh, possibilities for the potential for the future. What I feel to recognize was that I'm leading a civil service with 120,000 people. And if this guy keeps going, he is damaging the capacities of 120,000 people. So that was big failure. In a desire not to do something bad for this individual, I was so focused on the individual, I failed to recognize that I'm dealing with 120,000 careers and I should have paid a lot more attention and given a lot more importance or emphasis to those 120,000 than to this um, individual. So I want to say, therefore, uh, the big lesson for me is when you have to make a critical decision, just bear in mind um, what is the impact, where really should the primary emphasis be? And in that instance, I emphasize the wrong thing. Here's another question from one of your colleagues, uh, actually, Bert Hofmann, who is a director in the East Asian Institute at uh, MUS, okay. the National University of Singapore. Yes. Um, okay. Here's his question. What is the one thing you would have done differently in your career and why? Uh, to, 
uh, well, you know, I, I'm going to give you an unsatisfactory answer. First, you say there are no real answers to hypothetical questions, okay? Uh, uh, to me, at every, every instant, I felt that, um, uh, that uh, um, I did the best that I could. Uh, that uh, uh, to me, I have this kind of perspective about work. And every time I go into a situation, uh, I look at, so what's interesting about this? What can I do to make things better than, than when I found it? I mean, this is my basic attitude towards any assignment that, uh, that I'm given. So I found everything in my whole civil service career is so um, interesting. I can tell you that when I retired from civil service in 2006, my idea was uh, to have a lot more time at home to play with my grandchildren and to do to them uh, all the things which I had failed to do with my own children. So I thought I could build a future better while having fun with my grandchildren. Uh, and then I was approached to be first a chairman of the Economic Development Board in Singapore. And second, uh, uh, I was again approached to be group president of GIC. Uh, and, um, and to me, it's like that, you know, um, uh, uh, I, I turned down both, both of these approaches um, but then later I was, I was told that uh, they really had, had thought about uh, a whole lot of different candidates and decided that, that um, uh, they'd like to have me there. So, okay, so maybe it is out of a sense of, of um, responsibility and uh, uh, above all else, I decided to take on these appointments. So what would have been done differently? Well, I suppose, um, no, I wouldn't have done anything differently. You know, I, I think I would still have this attitude about saying, you know, Whatever is interesting, just like I, I joined the Stars International Board, it's just interesting, so it came. So, you know, you just go in and see what can you do to make it better and what can you, what can you learn uh, and how can we be better people and how can we make the organization better. <laughs> Here's another question from Stars alumnus <clears throat> Oscar Wang. He's the Managing Director and Head of Shanghai at Teneo. Um, here's yeah. a question. How would you evaluate talents, whether they have the competency and capability to lead an organization uh, going through a tough and disruptive market environment? To be frank, at the end of the day, only a crisis will really bring out the person. We can easily be making the wrong assessments of, of people. You try the best to assess people, try the best that you can to, to um, help them, um, uh, to uh, develop them. But it's on a crisis that's only to bring them out. As they say, you know, it's only uh, when the tide goes out, you know who has been swimming naked. I mean, basically it's that. So I want to say this, that all through my civil service, uh, that, uh, that, we, uh, that we had a very big program to look for talent, to look out for what people are capable of. And there was a particular quality we looked for, which uh, uh, if I can adopt shell terminology, they call it the helicopter quality. The point about helicopter quality is... Um, as in a, a helicopter, if the helicopter is at a high altitude, you can see the total landscape. But at the same time, the helicopter can come to a lower level so that you can concentrate on particular areas. You know, you can see where the crowd is, you can see where the problem is. So you bring the helicopter down to a lower level and you can see exactly, uh, uh, exactly what the problem is. So the point about helicopter quality is you're all the time looking for somebody who can look at a big picture uh, and at the same time understand that they also have a particular job to, to, um, to remove blockages in the system. They got a particular job to attend to perhaps small operational details which have a critical impact uh, on the success of the program. So you need to look for somebody who has both these capabilities. If you can only see the big picture going forward, they will end up in the strategy or planning department. If you see only, if people are doing just a small thing, then they go into the machine operator and at the most they're going to be chief operating officer. But you know, if you're looking for talent who can run organizations in unusual circumstances, you're really looking for somebody who can see the big picture with an open mind as well as attend to the small details and perhaps bring about uh, innovation and initiative there. But ultimately, you need a crisis to bring these people out, which is why my own attitude about crisis is this is good fun. You know, this is exactly the opportunity to sort out the people who can uh, not just take the stress, can function uh, in a crisis, uh, as opposed to a good number of people who can't, um, because uh, there are a good number of people who need to know all the details before they can uh, make any decision. There are a good number of people who want to be sure about things rather than take the risks and make adjustments as they go. 
Uh, and yet, um, given the uncertainties of the world, we need more and more uh, people who are prepared to, um, um, uh, to shoot first um, uh, and, then, uh, and then move along and learn as you go. Like they say in stars, you know, expect the unexpected. Whatever you try to do, you can say expect the unexpected. But you can only sort out the guy who can live with the unexpected when he is in such a crisis. Important thing again, if you find a person failing in such a crisis, a crisis is not a time to say, let's give him a chance with a bit of coaching, with a lot of patience, we'll be able to get through. In a crisis, we say, I'm very sorry. I think it looks like you may be in my second team thinking about the future, but I really need somebody who's totally hands-on in this situation. Unfortunately, we have already run out of time, but I will take one okay. question from the audience uh, before we have to wrap okay. up. Uh, the question okay. comes from Stars alumna Stefanie Frey. She's a organizational development manager at Buller. Um, she's asking, what has been your motivation to become a good leader and has it changed over time? Um, you know, basically, one of the things I discovered is I like to see people succeed. I like, uh, I like to help people succeed. I like to help organizations succeed. Uh, to me, every time I go to a place, the question in my mind always is about, you know, how can I make this place better? How can I make this place uh, meet its full uh, potential? So this is what gives me energy. You know, what's, what's new, what's, um, uh, what's different I can, I can uh, bring about. Not in a way that will make the place collect, but in a way that can gradually rebuild its capacity and rebuild uh, and reach out to its potential. So that, that's what keeps me going. Um, do something good to the organization, do something good to people, but most particularly people because I, and be, and because I, I like, you know, it just makes me very happy to be able to help people um, realize their potential. With that wonderful closing statement, I would like to thank you very much, Seung Guan, for your time and for sharing your insights with us. Thank you, Seung Guan. Yeah. Yeah, thanks very much, David.